The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or when you use our code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a mom of three kids, ages two, five, and seven, and I live in Southern California. And I'm Megan. I am the mom of five kids, ages six through 17, and I live in Michigan. This is the Mom Hour, part of the Life Listened Network. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 56 of the Mom Hour. I am Megan Francis, here as always with Sarah Powers. Hey Sarah. Hey Megan, how are you? I'm great, and I'm excited about today's topic because we're talking about moving with kids, but also in sort of a broader sense, creating community where you are, and I think that's something that can apply regardless of how long you've lived in a place. Definitely. We've gotten several, I mean, three or four specific requests to talk about moving, moving to another house within the same city or to a new city or state. And our listeners know from getting to know us that we've both moved quite a bit. Um, my family yeah. and I moved from Arizona to California almost two years ago. You guys have moved a lot. Um, yes, many, so many I'm happy we get to address this, but also we did want to kind of broaden it in case you don't have an impending move or your your roots are firmly settled. We just want to talk about kind of cultivating community for yourself and your kids and your family, no matter where you live. And that kind of, wouldn't you say that kind of ebbs and flows? You go through times where you kind of have all your people in your community and mm -hmm. then something shakes up, whether it's schools or a new phase of life. So it's always, I think, something to be good about. And it ties in with an interview you're going to do pretty soon, right, Megan? Yeah, with my good friend Melody Warnick, who has a new book out that's all about kind of creating um, the, just kind of that sense of settling in where you are. Yeah, it's and, called This Is yeah. Where You Belong, The Art and Science of Loving the Place You Live. And we're going to yes. have her on for a special bonus interview. I think that will air in July, most likely. So. Yeah, she's a writer friend of mine who I, I think also, she has um, a couple little kids and her and her husband... I believe as a pastor, um, moved around quite a bit when their kids were little. And I think she, she talks to a lot of people in the book um, about their experiences of kind of having a hometown, something that I never yeah. really have felt like I've had until now, I guess. And it's, I don't know, it's weird. It's like, I never really, I wasn't raised with having that hometown feeling um, yeah. and resisted it for a really long time. And, and I'm just kind of starting to embrace that idea. So uh, yeah, I can't wait for that interview, which will be, I don't know, I don't want to make any promises. It will be airing sometime in the, in the sometime future. Sometime this summer. <laughs> sometime this summer. Coming to you soonish. Coming to yes. you soonish. Um, but that will be kind of a great compliment to this episode. Yes. So we're going to talk specifically about moving with kids. We're going to answer a couple of listener questions, and then we're going to talk about creating community. Um, first, though, our very first listener question on this topic came from Amy Sloan. Amy's a longtime listener. Um, and she called in via SpeakPipe, which is um, so exciting. Everybody can do that by heading to our website and calling in and asking us a question this way, which allows us to put your lovely voices on the show. So here's Amy's question. Hi, ladies. This is Amy from North Carolina. I love your podcast. I've been listening since the beginning. And I have a question about gas stoves and ovens, which is so weird. But I've actually never had one my whole life growing up. We always had electric. My whole adult life, we've had electric. And now we're moving into a new home in a couple weeks with a gas stove and oven. And I'm completely freaking out. Everyone always says, oh, gas stoves are the best. If you like to cook, you'll love them. And I do love to cook. But I have this horrible fear that I'm going to blow up my house or leave a towel on the oven and it'll catch on fire or we're going to die of carbon monoxide poisoning or something totally crazy. My imagination is running away with me. And I think some of it is just I've never had it before. Um, I don't know, like, the secret to the gas stove and oven. Do you guys have any ideas or wisdom to share about that? I know it's kind of weird and random. But I'd love to hear your 
I also have several young children, so that's another thing I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about because I do love to have them help me cook. All right. Thanks. Bye. Okay. So Amy, thank you so much for the question. I don't think it's silly at all. Um, I will say that I have had an electric stove now for a couple of years, I guess three years since I've lived in this house. Pre- uh, previously, I had gas and I miss my gas so much. <laughs> I am a total klutz. I am the kind of person who leaves things on all the time. And I actually found that having a gas stove made that a lot less likely because you can see the flame. So, you know, talking about like setting towels on fire, I've learned the hard way. You can easily do that with an electric stove, (laughs) with an electric range. I mean, anything that gets left on a burner and you can't always see that the burner is hot. Um, I've set things on fire on an electric stove and I've never done that on a gas stove actually, because you can see the flame. Same thing with kids burning their hands. Yes. Agreed. And I, you can control the flame so much more. It heats up quicker, but cools down faster. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I think as far as safety goes, I wouldn't worry about it. I know that's easier said than done, but, and, and it's very likely that the electric range you've had has actually had a gas oven connected to it because I didn't realize this till pretty recently, but many modern stoves, um, or, you know, ovens are gas with an electric range because apparently gas tends to heat more evenly. Okay. Or am I getting this in reverse? Is it gas? I don't know. I don't know about ovens. I I, I think I, I'm getting it in reverse. Whatever. Okay. Chances That's are good you've ovens. had a gas oven in the past and you didn't even know. That's what I'm getting right. at. <laughs> well, I first of all, I have to back up and say I love this question because, Amy, I don't know you personally, but you sound like you and I would get along great because when I am moving or going into a situation <laughs> where there's a lot of unknowns, I can really have a lot of specific questions about some random thing that I have no control over. So yeah. that would totally I was be gonna me say, thinking about I was about- going to say it sounds like a lot of anxiety is kind of personif- <laughs> like personifying totally. in this one thing. Yeah. And let's, let's uh, throw it out there that Amy has five children between the ages of five and 11, and she's moving yeah. – this summer. So, uh, all the anxiety, I can understand the anxiety, put it that way. Um, I was going to echo a lot of what you said, Megan, is I think having a visible flame is not that there's no danger with small children in stoves. Of course there is, but I think having a visible flame is actually a lot easier to teach and be aware of safety issues with small children than having an electric stove. Um, I've had an electric range where it was the glass top, the super flat, yeah. Um, and so that's even more, it's very, like, it's very strange. It doesn't seem like it would be something hot. that's yeah. hot. It's the whole surface yeah. is glass. Um, and I'm, I'm with you. I like the ability to adjust the heat. Um, I do, um, we can link to, cause she has small kids. Um, one of those, there are kind of a plastic guard that sticks out on an angle away from little hands. And maybe Amy's mm. kids are old enough that she wouldn't need this, but I'm thinking two, three, four-year-olds who are reaching up and they don't even see the fire and they're really right. little. Um, I know One Step Ahead used to have one, and so I'll look to see if they still do or I'll find something comparable and link in the show notes. So there are simple um, guards, and there's also things you can put over the knobs so that kids who like to fiddle with knobs don't actually turn on the flame. Yeah. Um, I will yeah. say I have taught my six- and eight-year-olds how to turn on and off the range. I'm a big fan of just giving them those skills. Not that they can do it whenever they want, but I'd rather they know how to do it than sit there absentmindedly fiddling with yes, knobs that they absolutely. don't know what they um, What else do I have? That was to- one thing I will say that that did kind of give me a little bit of worry about was not not so much the fire, but like if you don't actually engage the pilot, yes, then it basically becomes a gas leak. Yeah. Um, so I, I totally am on board with like, show your kids how to do it right and explain to them, you know, if you turn the knob and the flame doesn't come on, then gas is getting in the house. But right. I feel like this is one of those things where we don't, I don't really ever hear about modern day accidents with, no you know, with modern appliances. I just feel like those, a lot of those variables have been factored out with new technology. Right. And right. Um, yeah, so if you're clumsy though, don't, I mean, I'm clumsy and I had no more troubles with gas than electric less fewer sure. I fewer think that's troubles. good point well amy best of luck with your gas uh oven and stove and listeners please continue to use speak pipe so you can call in your own questions like that no question too random or specific as we've shown um and we love hearing your voices so you can find that app at the momhour.com in our sidebar it works on your mobile device or on your computer and you can re-record your question if you think you sound silly you just click delete and re-record and it won't send to us until you're happy with it. So it's lots of fun. 
And best of luck with the move, Amy. That's big. I know. That's big. Good yeah. luck. Well, let's oh, have... I did want to add. Oh, okay. go ahead. I want to add one more thing. Um, And I don't know how widely available this is here. I know it's more of a European thing, but for people who are freaked out by hot ranges, there is now uh, becoming available something called induction heating where the, it's basically like a, like a chemical reaction almost between the pan and the heating Mm -hmm. element, but it doesn't actually create heat. I don't actually know how this is possible. The heat only happens in the pan, but the burner never gets hot. Right. We are welcoming our longtime sponsor, Prep Dish, back to the show today. And listeners, if you're looking to boost your protein intake, Prep Dish is making it so easy right now. When you sign up in January, you'll get access to a month's worth of the new Prep Dish Protein Boost Meal Plans. I love this, Sarah. Protein is so important for our health. It helps support mental clarity, sleep, energy, hormone balance, and more. And as busy moms, we're often not getting enough protein, especially at breakfast. With these meal plans from Prep Dish, you'll learn how to quickly prep four protein-rich dinners and one breakfast. Right. And like all Prep Dish meal plans, they make it so simple to shop once, prep for the week ahead of time, and save time on busy weeknights by having your meals ready to heat and serve. And Megan, these meals sound so delicious and perfect for January. Listen to this. Slow cooker carnitas bowls, stuffed pepper soup, and then there's a Swiss chard mushroom and goat cheese frittata for breakfast. Okay, I am adding that stuffed pepper soup to my rotation ASAP. This is a limited time offer, so make sure to sign up before the end of January to get your free bonus meal plans. To learn more and sign up now, visit prepdish.com slash themomhour. Again, that's prepdish.com slash themomhour for a month's worth of the new Prep Dish Protein Boost meal plans. Check it out. Sarah, you know when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies. But having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start ritual or add essential for women 18 plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. Yeah, my parents had this thing in this temporary condo they were living in this summer. I never really mastered it, but yeah, I well, it's worth looking into. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, Well, Amy had also a while ago sent us an email just about moving in general. And like I said, we've heard from other listeners on this topic. Um, Do you just want, do you have any thoughts on the moves you've done, the last couple moves to new houses? Um, I think you and I have said offline before that we both secretly kind of like moving or like the opportunity, the fresh startness of a move. Yes. Yeah. Um, Yeah. We're going to plan a move in in about a year, um, not out of this town, just to a different house that suits us better um, as our family is changing and has changed. We've lived in this house three years and our family has changed dramatically because the kids' ages are all different now. And it's, I feel like we're like a completely different family than we were. Um, I am looking forward to it, even though moving sucks. I mean, we all know that. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to get really organized and get rid of stuff and start fresh. So yeah, yeah, I, I feel like last time we moved, we had a whole room that we just kind of used as a triage. And we made this rule that nothing could go out of that room until, like, as we were unpacking. Nothing could leave that room until we had a place for it. So oh, even if a good. box said, you know, kids room, I right. sat down because I wasn't going to do it on the front end. It was too, you know, it's too harried and fast. And I know. you just got to get out of there at some point. Yeah. But you know how stuff sneaks into the boxes that doesn't really belong in that box? Totally. Totally. And then the last few days, you just have those random box or boxes or black <laughs> trash bags that have like yeah. scissors and like tape and you Paper know towels. Yeah. a turkey baster, just like <laughs> random stuff that you found at the end that didn't go anywhere else. So we just had this like we had this setup area where everything like a like a station where everything was set up and every single box we opened it, we went through it and made sure the stuff was gonna stay and had a home before it yeah. was allowed into the house. And that was great. I mean, we started off. 
with like everything was just so streamlined and it stayed that way I guess to some degree but our basement and, and garage has gotten it's taken the the brunt you know yeah. of yeah. stuff we've added on without culling enough so right right yeah yeah no I I agree I think it's we always have these um high aspirations of going through everything before you move and realistically I think everybody can acknowledge that toward the end you're just chucking crap in boxes and knowing right. that that's okay and that you do have an opportunity to weed out um, when you get to the new spot. Um, I want to share a little hack that I did two summers ago when we moved um, out of state that I posted on our Facebook page back when we were the happiest home. And it like blew up our Facebook page with shares and comments. Um, but that was, I bought different roles. This is maybe a little above and beyond my normal organizational skills, but I bought different um, rolls of like brightly colored moving tape, packing tape. And every room that in the new house where we were going, that was the key is we were moving from a house that had a very different setup than this house. We had kids mm. sharing a room and here we don't, we had a loft playroom area there and here we don't. So I was, it was kind of hard for my brain to wrap around. It wasn't a direct translation. Does that makes sense. Like kitchen would yeah. go to kitchen, but there were several rooms where things were not going to go to an e equivalent room at the new house. So I did this color-coded packing tape, and I'd pack a box, and I'd put big, huge, like, obvious neon green, for example, if it was going to the kitchen, um, on that box as to where it was going in the new house. And then I made, like, a poster board, like, key code. Um, and the movers, I thought the movers might think I was, like, controlling and crazy, but they loved it because movers use little tiny, have you seen those, if you've ever had professional movers, they use little tiny stickers that have their own kind of coding system on them but oh, they loved okay. they loved the big um bright and it was so it was so calming for my brain to to look at things and then I would even put a little piece of that tape on small pieces of furniture or like you know a, a toy or a, something that wasn't going to go wrapped in a box I just put a little you know few inches of that tape to the underside of you know maybe a kid's chair or something from the playroom that was going to go in a bedroom um, so when we got here, the the visual cue was just so obvious. It was really easy to get stuff to the right place instead of looking, you know, when you write in a Sharpie, you've got to find where on the box you wrote it and is it on the top or I don't know. Even our kids could read the color coding. So that was a good system. That was a full house move from one state to another. So it was kind of, you know, above and beyond in some ways. If you were just doing a little easy move, wouldn't need it, but it was very helpful. And I think that was when I finally realized how much more organized you are than me. <laughs> it would never even have occurred to me to do that, but that's awesome. Yeah. I, I tend to be more like organized on the fly kind of person rather, right. you know, than have a plan ahead of time. It's more like, oh, let's just dig in and deal with this now. And sometimes a right. great system comes out of that, but usually it just, you know, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. This was one, one where it served, it did serve us. So I'll post a picture yeah. of it. Um, so you can see what I'm talking about, but it did help. Um, what other, do you have any other kind of tips for people who are moving? I wrote down a couple, um, but oh, yeah. cool. um, yeah. Yeah, go, go for it if you've got one in mind. Sure. Yeah. So another thing that I think, um, I didn't really figure out until a few moves in is that with a new house and a new layout, your book situation might change. And that was something that, you know, now I see as an opportunity again, because we have a lot of hand-me-down books in our house and books that were appropriate for one kid's age is now appropriate for another kid's age and reading level and all that. So, um, but even then, like I've lived in houses where the living area had a nice space for a bookshelf mm -hmm. and other houses where the bookshelves had to have be in bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing to think about ahead of time. If you can, it's like, otherwise you might just, if you're a book lover, like we are, like this whole family is, you might end up with just these random boxes of books. Yeah. And books are and, heavy. So every, and they're heavy. Every step up yes. upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. And so that I, I kind of looked at that. That's something that definitely like this last time and um, I was much more careful about and this time going forward, I'm going to be much more careful about it. It's just making sure like I take a few minutes to really be careful about which box, which books I'm boxing together and where they're going to ultimately end up um, because they yeah. may not end up in the same place. They just like toys. It's a good opportunity yeah. to look at through toys yeah. and say, oh, this isn't really, we don't need this anymore. Or this isn't for this kid anymore. This needs to go in a more communal area. This needs to be passed down, like whatever it is. Yeah. Um, it's a good opportunity. Otherwise, I kind of feel like, you know, I have to say with our moves, books and toys have been the biggest um, clutter creator mm -hmm. and box creator. Everything else, I mean, toiletries, 
I usually just go through them and get rid of anything that's even close to being expired and kind of start fresh. Yep. Same thing with cleaning supplies. You'll use a lot of them during the clean the move yeah. anyway. So I leave kind of the ones that are like down to a few inches in the bottle. I just leave those in the old place and use those to clean up the old place. Right. Um, and like, I don't even know what medications. I'm trying to think of the things that create a lot of boxes. need to like boxes. Yeah. yeah uh, rather I think than... office, like offices and yeah. papers. Yeah. I mean, hopefully most of us are moving a little beyond having so many files and photo albums and mm -hmm. like, like that kind of stuff I feel like does take up a lot of space and it can, it can really be a, a source of stress if you start to go through it because it may not be your um, most organized area to begin with. So then when you start going through piles of papers then and yeah, it creates the same thing. Like, do I need to throw this away? Is this moving? Like, why didn't I file it properly in the first place? <laughs> All right. of that. But I'm just trying to think of other things that can kind of stack up um yeah no I, I think that you're right I think books toys office supplies and that kind of you know like the stuff that you put out on shelves we're not big about stuff on shelves we have little decor things and you know those things sometimes take a little longer to find a new home than they should <laughs> but well, I, I look say. at the end I look at the other end of the move as like I've got some time here yes. you know I'm not gonna stress myself out about having everything set up in a week no, I was actually going to recommend the same thing, especially with kids' toys, is that if they have enough to get going, usually they're excited to be in a new space. If they have sheets on their bed and clothes in their drawers or clothes in a suitcase where they know where they are, then I don't think you need to unpack toys right away. It's almost better to kind of settle in, wait to see, like you said, where the logical play and book and living right. spaces are, and then take your time putting stuff out, um, just like Christmas or anything else. With yeah, a, yeah. Like when they open up a box, it's kind of exciting. You don't need to pull everything out at once in the new space. Um, yeah, totally. a couple of, a and, couple of, and just the, the, just the house that's in the process of a move is like a big playland. There's going to be boxes right. everywhere, exactly. lots of open space or the furniture will be in weird places. I mean, kids can like, you get a lot of mileage out of just that, like a freshly moved into a house as a play space. Yes, you can also have a lot of toddler dangers. Violet was yeah, 18 months when we did the last move, and I just remember being so paranoid. Everything, scissors, like, yeah. I feel like it was, like, a total, uh, you know, danger zone. And you don't really know the house yet, so, right. you know, it's, exactly. Yeah. Um, a couple of quick tips I wanted to mention. Um, if you have little kids who are prone to anxiousness or worry, I know my kids were very confused. We forget what kids don't understand. My kids were very confused about what was coming with us and what was staying. And they would mm. make assumptions that they, that they were going to have to leave certain things behind that were totally coming with us, like the pillows and the sheets on their beds. Oh. Like, will I have the same... Well, I have my same bed spread, you know, because if you think if you go to a hotel or if you go stay at somebody's house, you have different sheets and pillows. Um, so it did help to slow down just enough to reassure my little kids, um, you know, what, what it really meant. Our dog was coming with us, for example, but oh, yeah. you know, our, the refrigerator wasn't, you know, just like little mm -hmm. and things that would be in the new place for them. You know, yes, we will have you know, whatever it is, we will have a backyard or we will have things that they, they can't picture it and they don't know what to expect. So I think that does help if you have little kids who are prone to worry or, you know, get thrown out of sync when big changes happen. Um, another yeah. tip I saw was to pack a suitcase as if you're going on like a five to seven day trip, even if you're just moving across town. Um, and I think that is helpful if you have babies and toddlers and you're doing diapers and, you know, books and small toys, it, it kind of just helps to pack for a week. And then you can live out of that suitcase, both at the old place and the new place, but at least you have a week's worth of the small stuff, diapers, pajamas, clothes, small toys, swimsuits, or whatever it is in one big suitcase, like you're going on vacation. I don't know that I did that. Well, we were actually, we did actually need to stay with my parents for a few days. So we did have that. But um, I think that could be really helpful, especially in certain phases of parenting when your kids are little yeah. and they just need stuff. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I wanted to address the the thing about kids and their anxieties. And this is kind mm -hmm. of a little bit different, but along the, that li those lines, um, my kids have had really funny nostalgia for houses that we used to live in that mm -hmm. used to make me kind of feel bad because they would, they'd get really bummed out and say, remember when we lived in that house? It was so great. That house was so great. And I kind of have looked back and realized, first of all, the house that we just moved out of th three years ago was a fixer upper, half of which never got fixed up. The upstairs was junky. I mean, we, we just basically kind of gave up on that house. It was like, that is not going to happen. Um, the, you know, the backyard was really small. They remember it as this awesome, like 
so much better than the house we live in now, which I think it took right. me a while to realize it's just kind of normal. And the house we lived in two houses ago, there was this tree house in the backyard and the kids keep talking about that. Remember that <laughs> that house that had a tree house? Remember how great that was? Well, here's the funny thing. They would not play in the tree house. Like oh, I so thought fun. that was so awesome when we moved into that house and then they would never play in it ever. I had to force them. They pl- <laughs> might have played in it one time. I think there was a spider on it and one right. of them saw the spider and then that was it. None of them would go in it ever again. And so their memory of it is so different from reality yes. that I just think it's actually kind of funny now. But I used to get kind of bummed out, like maybe I made my kids move away from this perfect home for them. And now oh. I realize that's just how they remember things. Like yes. They are always going to latch on to things that aren't quite accurate. Right. And they were little kids. And, you know, right. so that's just something to keep in mind, too. That yeah. might happen as well. That's a Your good kids point. might miss things that weren't the way they think they were, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. Um I, don't, I think the only other tip I had was to let people help you with things. If you're a control person like me, let people help with things you wouldn't normally release from your control, like unpacking and organizing, because you can always redo it later. In other yeah. words, if you wait for you to be the only one to decide where the kitchen stuff goes in drawers, it's going to be that much more work, that much more stress. Um, I would say be liberal with accepting help. We always say that. I mean, that's a life lesson in general. But when you're moving, just let go and let people help you, whether it's a mother-in-law or a friend or your husband, but you, you know, it's not his normal domain. You can always tinker later when you've got like the, the basics unpacked. Um, I know my mom unpacked my kitchen. Actually, she did a great job in this house, but um, it is kind of hard sometimes to let go of, especially in the new space. In the old space, you're like, oh, just get it all Whatever. in. Whatever. But yeah. in the new space, we do, you know, it's our nest. And we do, if you're the one primarily at home or the one primarily responsible for home organization, it can feel like loss of control to let other people get in there. But you can always, you can always undo it later. It's better just to get rid of those boxes, get it somewhere where you can see it. So yeah. accept help. That was just my other one. <laughs> Oh, and I guess my final tip, unless you have more, um, my final tip would be it is okay to have takeout pizza and eat off paper towels and paper plates for the duration of the move. A yeah, I will time. say for me, for a long, I mean, just give yourself a couple of weeks. I'm being a little facetious, but really it's okay to go bare bones as far as like a meal plan and stuff goes. Because for me, I really want that first meal I cook in a new kitchen. I'm really, the one thing I really love to set up that I'm really bad at setting up, ironically, is the kitchen. I love doing it, but there's always something that goes, like I get confused by all the cupboards. I forget yeah, that certain I'm cabinets or cupboards it, are even but- there. Yeah. Have you ever done that? Like you'll move, you you put everything away and then you discover like one of the cabinets hasn't even been used because you (laughs) forgot it existed. So I do that. I'm terrible at it. It takes me a long time of tinkering to get it right. But I want like the first meal I cook in a new house to be relaxed and fun and have everything in a place and have it feel like a thing. I don't want it to be macaroni and cheese on the stovetop when I'm surrounded by boxes. So I've just kind of basically don't use the kitchen really at all except as a staging ground until it's all put away to my liking. And in the meanwhile, it's it's takeout. Right. Yep. No, I think that's, we, end of you the have budget. our, you have our permission <laughs> to yeah, do absolutely. takeout. All right. Well, let's kind of move on to the other part of this topic, which is really setting down roots and cultivating community for yourself and for your kids, wherever you live. And, um, just wanted to mention again, if you're just tuning in or you didn't hear us before that Melody Warnick was a friend of Megan's, Um, wrote a book called This Is Where You Belong, The Art and Science of Loving the Place You Live, and that she will be an upcoming guest on our show. And that kind of inspired us to shift to this conversation from our own experiences. And then Megan, you'll talk to her about the book and all of the research that she's done. Um, But you and I have both both moved a lot, both done bigger moves. um, And I think this is an important topic, even if you stay in the same town your whole life, because um, community is bigger than just (laughs) your neighborhood or your street or your kid's school. Um, and I think it can make, it can make or break our experience for, in a lot of ways, um, feeling like we're connected to our community. So I don't know. Do you have any like big picture thoughts to start us off? I have a lot of thoughts. (laughs) I think for me, okay. So we've moved a lot. Um, uh, as parents, we've the, we've lived here now, going on eight years. This will be our eighth year here because I was pregnant with Clara when we moved. Well, actually, so yeah, I was pregnant with Clara when I moved here and she's seven and some change. So it's been about eight years. Um, she is the only one of our kids who's been in the same 
place her whole life, which I think is just so weird. And the only other place that we lived before this for the uh, similar amount of time was in the Lansing area. But then we moved around. So we lived like in one little town for three years. Then we lived in Lansing for three or four years. And it was just, it was much more transient feeling, I guess, than we do now. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're really settling in. And I think I've, this last time I've learned, like, take it really slow. And that's hard for me because I get someplace and I want to know people right away and I want to jump into stuff. Um, Along the way, I've realized, and I think you probably agree with this, Sarah, I'm not much of a joiner. Like, I'm not much of a join a group kind of a person. Yeah. I'm unless there's there. something really compelling about it to me, um, mm-hmm. but just not for the sake of doing it. And so I kind of, you know, did some, like, right off the bat, I kind of got myself involved in a few play groups and book clubs and stuff that <laughs> ultimately just didn't really add a whole lot. And I, yeah. I kind of got myself entangled with people I didn't like that much. And it sounds terrible to say that. But it's true. Like sometimes there there is sort of this like um, – there's sort of like the social – what's it? Welcome wagon mm-hmm. kind of crowd. Mm-hmm. And those people are easy to hook up with, right. which makes them great. Yes. But sometimes what ends up happening with that is that there's like some drama involved with it or something. I don't know what it was. It wasn't that I individually had a beef with anybody. Right. It was or just sometimes like – sometimes it's just the super the, – the superficial level is great, but it may, yeah. never, it may never need to go beyond that. Right. And it wasn't that like, I like when I say I didn't like that much, it's not like I look at someone and go, ugh, I really just don't like you. It was more like I didn't like the experience of doing these group activities that I ended up doing. So it kind of felt like a waste of my time. Now, I will say that that was five kids in, you know, or four going on five. I have a best friend, sister-in-law who lives in town who I could always turn to as my go-to person. So I was four and I was kind of past that early baby stage where I just needed somebody. And I think that's a totally legitimate place to be too. If you just need people to talk to, right. people to go have coffee with or whatever, that is legitimate as well. Yes. Um, but you don't have to necessarily then rush into forming, you know, getting all your time eaten up by certain activities or forming best friendships with people you just met. I think sometimes it makes a lot of sense to sit back and like kind of let it unfold, mm-hmm. which is what I did this time. And it's worked out really well because I feel like, you know, every couple of years we'll get to a place where we're kind of ready to expand a little bit on our social circles again. Mm-hmm. And then we do. And then it feels really good the way we're doing, you know, and it's not yes. like we're deliberately marking it on the calendar. <laughs> right. But, you know, as kids get older, certain friendships fall off or yeah. you just have more time on your hands and there's more, you just feel it, you feel ready to just branch out a little bit. And right. if you do it slowly, then you find your people. Yeah. And, you know, and they're out there, even though you might move to a place where it feels like you're never going to find someone who's like you or that you really get along with or is interested in what you're interested in. They're out there. They're out yep. there. Yep. But they're not necessarily going to be um, in your play group or whatever board you want to join or, <laughs> whatever, right. you know, that right. kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. No, 100%. I agree. Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar, they have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them, and I was like, why would I give these to my kids? 
Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. I am also not joiner, although I can get sucked into joining things later on once I know a few people. I really prefer individual connection first. It's just much more comfortable Mm. for me. I don't even mind small talk. Like I really prefer um, knowing a lot of different types of people individually, either at a superficial level or a deeper friendship. And then if, you know, and then if a book club forms or some kind of organizational thing makes sense, I'm fine. I, I'm not going to opt out forever, but I never, it's not my style to join first and meet people within a structure. So, yeah, but I, I, either, I, I think we should say that for a, for a lot of people, that's a great strategy. And I'm so glad you said that about newer moms, because if you just, if it's really that time of life where it helps to be people in the same stage of life, then joining has really helped me at certain times in my life. So we're not anti- you know, join the PTA as a way to meet other moms or join a mom's group at all. Um, it, it's possible that we're just not in that phase of life or that it's not your or my personality, but by all means join yeah. people because we're not anti-joining. <laughs> um, right. Well, I just think you have to have your expectations. You just know kind of what you're getting into it for. And I remember having conversations with new moms um, often when I was a new mom and there being this palpable sense of like, where's my, you know, like remember those deep friendships you had in junior high or high Mm -hmm. school, they were kind of like a romance in a way. And those sister friend people that then when you have like little bit, unless you carried those people forward with you from high school or college or whatever, um, and they happen to have kids around the same time as you, and they happen to either live in your town or be someone you can talk to a lot, you know, in whatever way, those are all a lot of you know, maybes, right? So if you don't, yeah, (laughs) if you don't have that, it can be like so lonely to that time of life. And I find that there's like this palpable longing for those sister friendships that you can't just kind of create because they take time to grow. And so I feel like that, I guess, would be my only caveat is yes, join stuff because you just want to get out of the house right? and you want to talk to another mom and compare, you know, compare stories about sleeplessness and all those things. Absolutely. But you might not get that deep friendship out of it. And, right. and honestly, in, in that point of life, you may not really have time to, to cultivate it anyway, oh. or the energy, you know, your kids are taking up so much of your life force. Yeah. At and that actually, point. if we're talking about moving, if you happen to move in those stages of life, really young babies and toddlers, it's a great time to just get out there and join because all, even if the people who grew up in that town, are in new waters. So it's actually, it, yes. it, that stage of motherhood reminds me of my college experience because I went out of state for college. So I literally left all of my high school friends and made all new college friends. And new motherhood mm-hmm. is kind of like that in a lot of ways. Like you said, unless and less and less you're lined up perfectly with your past friendships, people are, it's, they're forging new relationships right and left. And they're pretty open to, and, you know, looking for those kinds of connections. So if you happen to join a new physical geographical community at the same time that you're joining motherhood, I think that can actually be beneficial because it's all new for everybody anyway. Um, I wanted to go back to something you said about um, the way you guys have expanded your social circle over the years because that's something I feel like Brian and I are kind of right in the um, middle of right now. As our kids get more independent, they have their own friends at school and we're not doing things it's we're not just doing preschool birthday parties or like mom's groups for me it's been really nice to have for example couple friends that are not 
couple mm-hmm. friends with kids the exact same age where it's the whole family. Yeah. Um, we went out to dinner with a couple from Brian's work the other night and you know, it was really fun. It didn't have to be brought together by the kids or the kids school. Um, and then I also, I think I've mentioned even on the show that I'm really kind of itching for some professional networking and like writer friends locally, which I really had a lot in Arizona and I hadn't really like reached out to here. So, you know, I've been doing a few things to cultivate those kind of professional relationships here. So I think when your kids get out of the itty bitty stage, there's also a real opportunity to start cultivating community for yourself that's not tied to your kids. And I know you guys have done a really good job of that because I know you have, Um, but it's nice to hear you talk about it. And I know you have friends who don't have kids or friends who you know, are a totally different stage of life. And like I said, couple friends, couple friends aren't something we've really had to have since before we had kids. Do you know what I mean? Because family, families get together and there might be a husband and a wife, but but to, to hang out with another couple or another, another adults outside of kids is just not something we've really done (laughs) for a long time. So yeah, definitely we've expanded our social circle. I think that, um, one of the things that's kind of helped us do that by doing it slowly, I feel like you find people through your people. And that's yes. always been the easiest, I think, and most successful way to make new friends. Um, for example, you know, for a very long time, John and I basically hung out with my brother and um, my brother's wife, Jenna, and their kids. And then we have another friend, Melissa, who we went to high school with who lives in town. She's a little bit busier, but she definitely was one of our main social circle type people. And then most of our other friends were from out of town. So they lived in Chicago and they don't have kids and we'd go hang out with them in the weekends and stuff like that. Right. But we didn't have like a huge bustling um, group here in town. And we still don't, frankly. But so like last year, my brother sold his house and hit it off with his realtor. And then we ended up hitting it off with his realtor and his wife. And now they're good friends of ours too. And then we've made friends through them. So it's kind of like yeah. Yeah. someone you like, you're also likely to like the people that they like. If, yes. if these are your people, then their people are probably your people. And yeah. um, I found that with theater too. So getting kind of into doing more acting and stuff, like I not, you know, theater is a eclectic and strange group of people. <laughs> and there are definitely folks I gravitate to more than others. Like there's people who are great to do shows with, but they're just a little avant-garde for me or something. I don't know. It's just, you know, we just don't match up as far as like how we're going to hang out and how we're going to spend our time goes. Right. I might like them a lot, but it's just like, how is this going to be a fit? Right. Right. But there are definitely always those people who are a fit. They're, they're everywhere. They're, there's going to be that person you really hit it off with. And, um, and then those people's people become your people. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what's so good about slowing down and not always defaulting to my kid likes this kid, therefore, ergo, I have to be friends with this kid's parents because it doesn't yeah. always work out that way. And there's a group of moms that um, who some of their kids are friends with some of my kids that I've resisted joining the group, not because I don't think they're individually lovely people, but I just don't really do kind of the big group thing. <laughs> it's just, yeah. you know, unless I sort of curate it myself, I'm not mm-hmm. comfortable sort of coming into a group that already exists. I find that often there are sort of a lot of, um, I don't know, it, it has that clicky feeling. Sometimes mm-hmm. there's like the social director person who has mm-hmm. to know everybody and you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. We all know I'm, I'm beating, I'm dancing around this, but we all know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about here. So I kind of resist that and have often just kind of skirted the edges and then tried to find the, the people that I like. And then yep. I become friends with those people individually. I don't have to be in on the group. like, And I don't have to feel bad about the fact that I don't get invited to the group stuff either. Right. That's another important thing. Yes. Like, I can just like the person I like that I really hit it off with and just spend time with that person. And we've had yep. success doing that with a couple of like bigger groups that have been around forever. And I really don't have much interest in hanging out with the whole crew all the time. Right. Not to say I wouldn't right. sometimes, but right. I just – I operate more – individually in small groups. Um, but I can be friends with just one person or we can yep. be friends with just one couple. And if I don't get invited to like all their parties and stuff, that's okay. I, it's not a slight against me. It's just that all these circles overlap at different points. It's like the yep. Venn diagram of friendship, yep. right? And it's not always, there's not always going to be a complete overlap and the circles are not always going to just fit neatly over one another. That's which is like why I kind of like diversifying and not yep. just having that one group that you're always with. No, I think that's Hopefully so... that came out right because I feel like it sounded yeah. super judgy and I don't mean no, it that no. way at all. No, I, I think that's... I No, I don't think it came out that way at all. Um, and I on that note, I want to give a shout out to Technology Man because yes. I am a much... 
I am much more com- comfortable nurturing some of these types of community building and relationships via text and Facebook. And yeah. I'm not, not, I don't think I'm hiding behind a screen, but with as crazy as I have kids in two different schools. We're relatively new to the area. I'm like you. I don't really like the big group thing. Um, So it's really nice for me to exchange numbers with somebody real quickly and then just shoot them a follow-up text later. Like, hey, I really like talking to you. Like, let me know the next time you guys are going to this park. Or um, Because I feel like there's little ways you can nurture. You can use technology, whether it's social media or texting or email, um, to kind of like deepen and nurture those newer relationships so that when you are in a big group, you have that, you know, you have built that in the in-between. Because the idea of like mommy coffee dates, I don't even know anyone who really does that, who like meets up for coffee while their babies play in the background. I don't, I mean, that's a great opportunity to get to know somebody, but it doesn't always happen that way. And big groups can be hard. So I just want to throw a shout out to technology in general as a way to, sometimes it gets a bad rap for like robbing us of interpersonal communication, but I actually think in a lot of ways it can support these types of connections. I totally agree. And can I add something to this? This might sound a little cheesy and very Brene Brown of me, but not that (laughs) Brene Brown is cheesy. She's quite the opposite. I always feel like when I try to talk about this stuff, I sound cheesy. Yeah, I know. know (laughs) Um, But I think sometimes like putting yourself out there and letting yourself be a little vulnerable in that moment is can be really helpful. So um, like the, the mom I was just talking about actually that was kind of part of this bigger group that I then sort of became sort of a spinoff friend, I side guess. Friend. A side friend. Yes, a sidecar. A sidecar side friend. Um, I think, you know, she and I kind of texted with each other a little bit and she would just send me like little funny emojis and crap. I don't know. She, I think, I can't remember what it was. She was at a, a baseball, like clean up the baseball field day and she was texting me about how much it stunk. I didn't have to go for some reason and she was really jealous that I didn't have to be there. And I wrote something like, I like you. Like, I think we're going to hit it off, you know? And sometimes it's like, just say that, you know, if you, if you feel like you feel a connection with somebody or like you're going to be friends with that person, I, someone kind of has to be the first one to say, Hey, like, I'm not just texting you because our kids are friends or this isn't just me being like, this isn't me just saying we should get together because that's a socially a polite thing to say, because I will never do that. I will never say to someone we should get together unless I mean it, (laughs) but they don't know that, you know? So, um, yeah, so just saying like, oh, I like you or you that's funny or you know, just yeah. I think sometimes that little extra edge and maybe the other person's thinking it too and they're like, "Oh, god, I'm glad you said that because I really like you too and let's actually make this happen." Otherwise, it's so easy to get buried in all these socially like yeah. required invitations and yep. texting that has to go on that sometimes just doesn't need to go beyond politeness. And right. exactly. so if you kind of push it a little bit I think it can and, lead to good stuff. And I would add to that, don't make yourself, don't feel guilty if there are some people that you just, like Clara said, I just don't enjoy her. Remember when we talked about the playground politics? Yes. If there's just some people that you just don't enjoy, that's okay. Yeah, hey, just you, enjoy. Did, you didn't like fail at, you know, developing relationships in your community. It's just move on to the next one. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about like, we were talking about community, but I want to talk a little bit about like your town and your school and your neighborhood and some of the actual geographical components. And I wanted to share that I, for a long time, have felt kind of small town envy or like Main Street USA envy because I have lived um, all of my life of having kids in very sprawling suburban mm-hmm. strip molly places where most people are from elsewhere. They have moved from other places. Arizona is very much that way I would say where we are in Orange County is a mix there are people who are born and raised here but even then they might be born and raised an hour away or something Um, and so I've always kind of felt like I love the idea of shopping local and having your local downtown and um, had a little bit of like idealism around that and what I finally realized especially moving here and we're in a small suburb in a sprawl of many suburbs is that you can you can be local and think local and appreciate local stuff wherever you are. If you are living, you are living in a town, a suburb, a city, or a rural area, but there's some kind of, there's something that makes that uniquely local. And, mm-hmm. and so I've just tried to like change my mind a little bit about that. Um, yeah. And I, again, as my kids are going, getting older, we're going to the local library more. We go to the same, you know, the grocery store and the, yeah, it might be a chain grocery store, but it's the same people who work there every week and they are part of our community. So I think for me, that was just a mindset shift. I was a little down on suburbia. I was down on strip mall 
you know, like chain stores and kind of wished for this more idyllic situation. Um, and really, I just needed to change my mind because you have a local, you have localness wherever you are. Yeah. And community is what you make of it. And so is your, yeah. your hometown. Um, I totally agree. And I will also say, as much as I do love sort of this little small town environment that I'm in, um, it has its downsides. You know, this is a town of 10,000 people and many of them have lived here their entire lives. Yeah. And many of them come from <laughs> prominent families who have been here for generations. And I'm not going to say it's not it's not overt like you hear about like southern small towns where if you're not, right. you know, <laughs> if you haven't been there forever that you don't fit in and no one likes you. Like, And it's not just a southern thing, but it's kind of that stereotypical. Yes. You know, um, I... I, it's not like that. It's not in your face. No one ever says to me, oh, so you didn't come from St. Joe. It's not like that. There's enough transplants here. There's enough um, There's enough newer people here that that would be kind of silly, I think. But there is sort of the sense that there is a group of people who all went to the same schools and all know each other. Yeah. And, um, and I don't have that anywhere. You know, I don't right. have – I was saying earlier to you, Sarah, I think before we started recording, like I've really have never had a hometown um, – it's funny, I spent three summers here as a kid because my dad was actually remarried for a little while and he and his wife lived in this town about a block from where I currently live, our current home. And okay. so I spent three summers here and I found out that one of our good, the newer friends that I was mentioning that's a realtor, um, and I may have played on the same baseball team as a kid. Oh. So we figured that out. And actually that made me so excited. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, I have this connection with this place and I don't really have that with a lot of places. So I think that's kind of a fun feeling for me, but at the same time, I think it can get a little old for people who are living in truly small towns or who maybe are from those small towns yeah. and you can't walk five feet without running yeah. into someone you knew. Yeah. And um, I'm like about a half an hour from the place I went to high school. Definitely has that very home. I only lived there for three years, but that's probably the closest thing I would say that I have to like a hometown. Right. And, you know, I see on Facebook, there's a huge contingent of people that I went to school with who still live there and many of them married other people, you know, from different grades or whatever, but there's just like this huge community there. And in some ways it's awesome. And I see how close knit right. it is. And then in some ways I'm like, Oh man, that just feels like those people knew me in some of my worst moments. And right. I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of glad also to have a little distance from it. So I think, yeah. but if I live there, I would totally find a way to embrace it. So, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, you can see the positives and the negatives to wherever you are. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes the suburban neighborhoods have it can be very family focused. They have great amenities often that mm -hmm. we really don't have, I will mm -hmm. say. Um, often like the housing situation, the way the developments are set up are just like a lot more family friendly. So there's something to be envied about yeah. basically anything. Yeah. And that's where <laughs> so. we are now. It's very planned community. Our town was not even incorporated until the early nineties. It was part of sprawl. Uh -huh. But it wasn't. And so since it was incorporated relatively recently, they did a really good job. Like what they call the town center yeah. I, is really like it's all chain restaurants. And, right. you know, it's nothing like what I think a historic downtown in the Midwest, like those, you know, Chicago suburbs that I've been to looks like. But they did a good job planning it. It has a fountain. It has yeah. a grassy area where families can picnic. They do Fourth of July fireworks there. So, um yeah, so we I agree. There's there's pros and cons to every situation. Um, how about do you have anything to say about how your kids have connected now that you've been there eight years? Is there any like anything you can think of to help people kind of give their kids roots in a community or help kids kind of feel connected to where they live? Yeah, you know, I think that something we've done um, maybe just by accident um, pretty well is really let the kids from pretty young age. And that's, again, something that's a lot easier to do in a small town um, where it's relatively, like, where I feel relatively safe about them kind of tooling around and where all the kids in the neighborhood school live in the same general area. Yes. I will also say that yeah. makes it a lot easier. But I've let the kids more or less manage their social lives. And yeah. by that, I mean, like, from the age of seven, they were choosing who they're friends with and they don't yeah. play with kids they don't, you know, enjoy, as Clara said. And yeah. They often will, and and you can almost like almost see them even do the compromise, um, between like the kid they'd really like to hang out with, but who lives far enough away that moms have to arrange the right. rides and all that, and the neighborhood friends who yes. are are good to play with today. And I think yeah. that that's kind of like that translates so well to adulthood too, right? You know, yeah. we've got our friends who are like the people. If we could choose who we want to spend the time with right now, um, and time and distance and geography and all that was no was no uh, factor, then we might choose different people than we would choose if we just want to go out to dinner. But right. 
sometimes, but those, but everyone held, has a place and right. it's all valuable relationships. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I've seen them kind of navigate in their heads. Like, is it worth it to just, you know, bike around the corner and go see if so-and-so is home and, you know, because I may be going to hold out. And that's the other right. thing. Like I've tried to teach them the politeness. Yeah. You can't make plans with one kid and then you're yeah. holding out for someone else. That's not yeah. fair and that's not kind. But at the same time, like they have to kind of learn how to navigate that too, yeah. you know? So I don't know. I think they've, they've had a lot of the same friends. Um, my older kids, like Jacob just graduated last weekend and it was really fun seeing him sitting in the stands or in the, in, in the chairs with some of these kids who I don't even recognize anymore. And then they got up, you know, they said their names and they got up to get their diplomas. I was like, what? Oh. That's little <laughs> Levi or that's little whoever. And they, but this, those, he might not hang out with those kids at the same way or the same amount, but they're still, those bonds are still pretty tight and they're still obviously yeah. friends. And I would say the same for um, the other kids. Like they have tight friendships that they've made and, um, they're particular about who they'll hang out with. And I don't know if that's maybe because they have so many siblings that they can be. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's not really yeah. worth it to them to leave the house if right. the company they're going to hang out with isn't better than what right. they already have. Right. So, and I think that that's, that's another benefit of having more kids in the house, but they're particular and they've taken their time to develop friendships and they've really connected with, they've really created some really strong lasting friendships. And I, I like, I've really enjoyed watching that yeah, that's kind of so play good. out. That's so yeah. good. Could be totally different with Clara. She also has cousins, though, you know, and then she's right. got the cousin's friends. And then that right. kind of expands her group without her having to work very hard at it. So right. she could have a very different experience. I don't know. But right. with the boys, for sure. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, we're still so kind of new to this area. But one thing I feel like that's helped us as a family is to get outside our little suburb and explore the area. So if you're new, if you're new, we've been talking a lot about social relationships, but if you're new to an area and just want to kind of start to feel like it's home, like, like it's rooted. I know it was very unnerving to me to not know my way around this like very big populated County and mm. people, and there are a lot of people who are from here, and just they talk about the freeways and the roads. And I just felt like I didn't know anything. And I, I just feel more and more rooted when we take little side trips. I mean, I'm talking 30 minutes, not even yeah. like a weekend or anything. Um, but we've tried to be pretty intentional about that when we can as a family. And I think it helps the kids too to see like this is where we live. Because I mean, Target looks the same everywhere school and a classroom and you know but yeah. for them to start to feel like this is where we live and it is because we moved out of state it's very different and start to feel like oh we're gonna go up to Huntington Beach or we're gonna go down to San Diego or we're gonna go and know as adults we know where these places are I don't know so that's kind of helped I feel like create a sense of place for yes for us both, and I think that's both really important too staying local and cultivating those local patterns our local library and our local you know the where we run our errands and where we like to go to eat but also then the next kind of ripple in that pond would be the larger regional area mm -hmm. and I don't think we were very good about that in Arizona to be honest partly because people have to get out of Arizona when it's hot yeah. and partly because of the ages. We were just having babies. So right. it's just, we, I think we did Flagstaff once to go to the snow, but we just really were not very good about. And so I think it's more of a phase of life thing. It's not yeah. Arizona's fault. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've tried to really create that sense of place regionally here. And it's, it's helped me feel more like this is my home. You know, yeah. I, could, I know, I know which way's North. It's, well, it's and it's also that it's not that you weren't good at it necessarily or good about it. I mean, it was a different phase of life. It was like yeah. the difference between being like in the weeds, getting by, just doing the yeah. essentials, which maybe the essentials are I keep my kids alive. Yeah. Um, I, I buy groceries. Yeah. I do the laundry. I try to see people in my town yeah. And that's about as much as I can manage. And then as they get bigger, you can branch out like that. Like you, I love the thing about the sense of place. We lived here for – years before and we lived in like this area that's just dotted of little small charming towns all along Lake Michigan and they all have their own little flavor and there's lots to do in this general area but we did not branch out until yeah. pretty I mean in the last few years because we just was busy we had every time we went someplace we had to take all yeah. of the kids I mean it was yeah. just a little bit overwhelming and so to me that's totally like a phase of life thing that now it's yes. no big deal to throw everyone in the car and go to a different beach than we usually go to or go to a different town and just have ice cream or whatever yes. just to see it. It's not a big deal. But man, it was a big deal for a while. So well, and that's <laughs> such good advice for people that are listening who aren't 
aren't moving, but who are kind of stuck. I mean, I think you said at the start of this conversation that you go through phases where you start to try to branch out. And so moving can provide an opportunity to do that. That's what happened to us. We moved right at the stage where our kids were getting easier and yada, yada. But if you're not moving, it's still a great time to kind of shake things up every once in a while. And I think day trips and, you know, changing up where you go and who you hang out with is, is a great way to do that. So agreed. Well, I think we were going to wrap up if we have time with our regular segment about what's going on in yes. our lives. Um, do we have time for that? Sure. Yeah. Go for awesome. it. Awesome. Well, I kind of wanted to do something different and talk about, I've been listening to a lot of other podcasts lately, both, um, both for kind of research and to stay on top of what's out there, but also just for my own enjoyment. Um, so I wanted to kind of shout out to a handful of podcasts just in case they'd be interesting to others. Um, the first one is called the Coffee and Crumbs podcast. And Coffee and Crumbs is a pretty popular blog, collaborative blog for moms, very much, I think, geared toward moms of babies and toddlers, which is why it might have just missed my radar. Um, but they are a very popular website. They have great essays and beautiful writing about motherhood. And then they started the podcast. Um, but I think they're doing a great job and they're relatively new. So I know we have a lot of listeners who have babies and very young toddlers, very young kids. So their topics are all very pertinent to that stage of life. They're doing a great job with the podcast and they're easy to find. It's just, they're just search for coffee and crumbs podcast. And you guys are probably familiar already with their yeah. website. Um, another one, Megan, I don't know if this is on your radar is hashtag am writing with KJ Delantonia of the New York times well family blog and Jessica Leahy is an author oh, and well, um, writes funny. about education. I know them both and I'm very familiar with the hashtag, but I did not know it was a podcast. It's new. It's relatively new. Okay. So I want to say they launched it right around the time we were at mom 2.0, the conference, um, or right after that. So they're only maybe six or eight episodes in and it had been, I'd been wanting to listen and keep forgetting, you know how that happens. Like, Oh, yeah. oh. Um, but I did, and and it's going to be really fun to listen to. So if you're a writer, um, the hashtag am writing, which is an actual hashtag that's really good to follow on Twitter if yeah. you're a writer. Yeah. Um, but they are really fun and funny. I don't know them personally. I just know of them. Um, but they are fun and funny, and they talk a lot about getting stuff done and procrastination and all the things that writers deal with. Um, and then on a totally different note, I am rather obsessed with politics this year. I won't go into detail except that it's sort of a spectator sport for Brian has always been this way about politics. He's really knowledgeable and he gets into kind of like the stats aspect mm. and kind of the yeah. behind the John scenes. does too. Like he knows all the delegates and all yeah, exactly. the numbers and I'm it's, like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's much more about like almost the political science than it is political ideology. Uh, but the NPR politics podcast is fantastic. If you're someone who gets really frustrated with just clickbaity headlines and really partisan stuff, the NPR politics podcast is podcast is a round table and they do one every Thursday that just recaps the week. And it's the only political thing that doesn't either make me mad or make me bored. So, nice. um, I mean, you could argue that NPR has some leanings one way or the other, but I don't find it particularly biased. Um, so that may be my own bias. But I think it's definitely worth a try if you're feeling like you want to be more informed, but you can't stand another terrible like Facebook share headline. <laughs> um, and then really quick, um, for Game of Thrones fans, I had to ask Brian about this one because I don't watch Game of Thrones, but there's a whole bunch now of like TV show podcasts that like recap the show. Yeah. I know I was listening to one about Downton Abbey when that was on that was really good. But um, Brian recommends one, and it's just called the Game of Thrones podcast, but it's from baldmove.com is the people who do it. And he listened to several before he settled on that one. So just in case we have... I'm sure we have some fans in, exactly. in the audience. So yeah. that's a good one. And I will link to all of those in the show notes. All right. Well, I was going to talk about something a little bit... I don't know. It feels a little vain of me, but I guess it's not. Um, <laughs> well, I think I mentioned on here a couple of months ago that I started working with a trainer and I wanted to come back and give an update because I had my doubts about, you know, I've, I've said I'm not really a joiner. I've never been one of those people who accountability partners really do much for me as far <laughs> as working out goes because I don't really love working out that much. But I will say I have stuck now with a trainer. I've seen her twice a week, every week without fail, um, except for one week she was on vacation, and then I'm going to be going on vacation, so I'll have to figure something out. But now for, I want to say, nine weeks. Yeah, it's been a while. So I'm pretty proud of myself. She works me hard, but I gave her some parameters going in of things I didn't really want to do and what I really did, like the goals I really wanted to um, 
to reach and kind of what I was there for. And she kind of made me this program. And, you know, I pay her. And if I don't show up, I lose my money. And yeah. she doesn't really do anything. She's very chill. She just stands next to me and watches me. Yeah. <laughs> and she hands me stuff, which is actually really helpful. Like, you know, and I've done the weight room now um, a bunch of times, like, you know, now nine weeks times twice a week. So like I've been in there, you know, like 16 to 18 times. And she gets me set up on a machine and then hands me the thing and says, do this. And just yeah. having that that support has made a huge difference. It's so huge. yeah, so I'm getting kind stronger of, you, for sure. Yeah. Do you feel like progress in terms of your whatever your goals were, energy yeah. or fitness or I feel like I'm definitely getting stronger. I feel like I probably need to add some cardio in. I sort of let that go during the play and stuff because I was just so busy. Um you know, I am not losing weight, which I was not really the goal anyway. And also I think maybe I've gained a little weight from muscle. Mm -hmm. over and but I I definitely feel like things are shifting like I can tell a difference in my shoulders there's muscles in my arms I never was really working and it's always funny when she'll set me up with an exercise and I'm like oh what what's that (laughs) I didn't know I had a muscle there so she's really good about giving me a variety of stuff that keeps me interested and then usually like there's one one exercise that she has me do two um circuits so it's like three exercises upper body three exercises lower body usually start with lower body and then you do three sets of 12 reps. Mm -hmm. So you do three exercises, three sets, 12 Mm -hmm. reps. Um, And there's usually one that's terrible that I hate. (laughs) But then it kind of balances out like the rest of it's not so bad. So like if I can just get through the one I really, really hate, then I'm good on the other end. So I definitely I definitely think I'm making progress. I I can't tell a huge difference right now, but like the way I look. um, But it's probably so gradual. I don't know that I'll notice right away anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and the consistency is key because that's yes. so hard to do on your own. It is and very, very it's, hard. It's very to hard to push yourself on your own. I would I've, never. I would I would poop out after like seven reps. Every yeah. single exercise she gives me, there's no way I would do 12 if it was just me. Right. I just know yeah. myself I wouldn't do it. So it's totally been worth the money. It's been worth the time. You know, the investment of time is not a huge amount of time. I only see her yeah. for half an hour at a time. So yeah. Oh uh, yeah, if you've been kind of like trying to get back in the gym or just can't get yourself to stick with something and you have it in your budget, it's worth thinking about, you know. You and can I also do group training if you don't want to pay for someone um by yourself, you could, you know, do like with two or three other people as well. So And I love that you just told her exactly kind of why you were there and what you yeah. want up. But don't we get better at that as we get older? I was so think? clear. I was like, like, "Look, I'm 38 yeah. years old. I am too old to do burpees. I don't want to not <laughs> not that I couldn't do a burpee. Obviously, I could, but the point is I'm too old to like torture myself." Right. With and stuff I absolutely hate doing. Yeah. Yeah. So nope. Not doing burpees. Right. Or just like I gave her a whole bunch of these things I just was not interested in doing. Now, to be honest, I, to be fair, I also did say like I didn't really love doing body weight exercises and she throws them in there anyway because they're effective. Um, yeah. But she doesn't overload. Like she knows I'd rather lift a weight. Yeah. So she doesn't overload me with that stuff. Yeah. So, That's yeah. great. So awesome. I guess we should wrap up, eh? We should wrap up. Um, I want to remind everybody to check out themomhour.com and everything we talked about today because there was quite a bit we will link to in the show notes. While you're there, call in a question like Amy did. You can do it right on our website. Um, The app is called SpeakPipe um, and it says leave us a voice message or something like that. It's really easy. Um, And then, yeah, leave us a comment. Let us know what you thought of this episode and how you are cultivating community where you are. And also look for Megan's interview with Melody Warnick um, in a couple of weeks, most likely. Yes. All right. Have a good week, everybody. Bye, guys. Hi friends, Megan here. I wanted to let you know about a new podcast I've just launched called The Tea's Made. Think of it as a weekly cozy conversation with me over your favorite hot beverage on topics like wellness, creativity, family, hospitality, and more. Just look for The Tea's Made with Megan Francis wherever you get your podcasts or head to theteasmade.com to find all those episodes. The Tea's Made is your reminder to take a little break from the busyness of life. So come on in and get comfy. The Tea's Made.
The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or use code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour.